Hi, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal yesterday, and I'd like to read parts of it to you. I have a few questions and comments about it. It has to do with landlord tenant law. And the title of the article by Will Parker and Nicole Friedman is Everyone's a Landlord, Small Time Investors Snap Up Out of State Properties. Subheading With the help of recent technologies, laptop landlords are buying homes across the US. Okay, enticing to somebody who represents landlords. Let me read a little part of it to you. Jack Cronin found San Francisco area homes too expensive or too far from the city center to buy when he lived there in 2020. The tech worker still wanted a piece of the hottest housing market of his lifetime, so he started looking farther afield. Last year, the 28-year-old used a website called Roofstock, which provides listings and data for investors interested in rental properties to buy a three-bedroom home outside Jackson, Mississippi for $265,000. Mr. Cronin, who now lives in New York City, so from expensive San Francisco to New York, has never visited Jackson, nor met the tenants in his home, likely landscaped with bushes and crepe myrtle trees. That's the home, I think, not the tenants. It's enough to know that a management company collects $2,300 a month in rent for him. So far, so good, he said. Mr. Cronin is part of a new movement of laptop landlords in which individual investors are buying homes, often in other states, to rent out. Many are well-paid professionals who view owning rental as a core investment alongside stock or bond funds. Recent technologies that simplify the process and enable home purchases online have fueled the movement's growth. Let me scroll down a little. It's a long article and there's a lot to, uh, to digest in there. So I'm just reading some of the highlights. I recommend, even if you're not a, a Wall Street Journal subscriber, see if you can subscribe, just get this article and read it. It's fascinating. So here's a bit about Roofstock. Many of Roofstock's customers are coastal tech employees making $200,000 to $300,000 a year, said Gary Beasley, founder, sorry, co-founder and chief executive. These buyers would need some $300,000 in down payments to buy residential property in their own communities. For $40,000 down, they can buy a house in a lower cost market and charge rent that brings in steady profits. What we're seeing is people sort of decoupling where they live from where they own, said Mr. Beasley. What we're seeing is people sort of decoupling where they live from where they own, said Mr. Beasley. Scrolling down. Crowdfunding platforms have given small out-of-state investors a way to make fractional purchases in single-family homes as well. One of the newest, called Arrived, signed up 12,000 people to invest in 150 rental homes in the past year, with more than 100,000 others applying to make future investments through the company. For one starter home in Clarksville, Tennessee, 535 investors contributed to the purchase, some putting in as little as $100. Scrolling down. Evernest, another company that specializes in managing rental properties for out-of-staters, has circulated a white paper touting, quote, landlord-friendly, unquote, Mississippi, where there are no limits on how much you can ask a renter to pay for a security deposit and where evictions are faster than in other parts of the country. So what I want to think about is a couple of things. One, how did this happen? How did it come to be that rents got so expensive on uh, the East Coast and the West Coast, places like California and the state of New York? How did that happen? Answers on a postcard, please. And how did they increase so much so quickly after 2020? Why are rents going up so much now? In the wake of, say, um, the partial eviction moratorium that Congress enacted with the CARES Act, and that other states enacted nationwide, states nationwide enacted 
different eviction moratoria, like in Massachusetts, we had a partial eviction moratorium. I say partial because it was for non-payment of rent. Landlords couldn't start court proceedings or summary process for non-payment of rent cases during the eviction moratorium. And of course, there's inflation in other commodities as well, oil, which causes the cost of other commodities to rise. So there's inflation across the board, but rents seem to be going up a lot. Why is that? And was it reasonably foreseeable when Congress and state legislatures enacted the policies they enacted in 2020 and thereafter? Um, spoiler alert, yes, it was foreseeable. Lots of people predicted it. The other thing I'd love people to think about is the effects of this decoupling of where you live from where you own rental property. Well, you can mull over the morality of that if you want. What I'd like people to think about more is the practical effect. How does that affect the quality of the property? Because in Massachusetts, say, if you're a landlord and you hire a rental management company to manage your rental properties, you're still on the hook. You can't shuck off all responsibility onto the rental management company. You are still the owner. You're still the landlord. How does it work when you live in San Francisco? How is that going to work when you try to have someone evicted for non-payment of rent and they bring, bring counterclaims for bad conditions and uh, you don't know anything about it because you've you farmed out that responsibility you thought to a property management company. Surprise, uh, you are still the responsible party. And then what's the effect going to be on the, on the quality of the housing? Is this going to improve affordability? Is it going to do anything to make our housing stock better? Or is this yet another all too foreseeable consequence of idiotic policy decisions that our leaders made uh, while they were exploiting the COVID-19 pandemic. Anyway, love to hear your thoughts. Thank you.